and welcome to DIG School, cross-curricular learning themed around archaeology. This session is Tracing Places, when we'll be finding out how you can explore change over time beneath your very feet. Key questions we'll be looking at is how can you reconstruct how a place developed over time when there's no written evidence? And where can we do that? And why does this matter? So it's important to remember that today's settlements, the places we all live in, the towns, villages, cities, farms even, um, are mostly places which have had people using them for centuries, thousands of years sometimes. Even if the place you live in doesn't seem to be an important historical site or archaeological site, there will be evidence beneath your feet for decades, centuries or even millennia of activity. Just to get you started, a quick quiz about the history of settlement. We all live in a settlement as a settlement is somewhere that somebody lives. What do we know about their history? So here's some questions. Um, I'll put those up on the screen and uh, they're in your book. Uh, work through, choose the answers, put a circle around the correct answer and we'll go through them in a minute. So how did you get on answering those questions? Did you feel confident that you knew the answers or were you just making an intelligent guess? Let's have a look and see how you got on. So here are the answers. The first tools made by human, used by humans in the British Isles were made of stone, not plastic. Uh, when did people anywhere in the British Isles first start to live in permanent settlements rather than sort of moving around from week to week or season to season? Well, it's the Neolithic 5,000 years ago. When did people in the British Isles first start making pottery? Well, that's also the Neolithic, also 5,000 years ago. When did towns first appear in the British Isles? Towns being places where most people are earning their living through trade and production rather than through agricultural production. The answer to that is the Roman conquest. Uh, it was the first period at which towns based on commerce and trade, uh, and dense populations, not earning their money through agriculture, appeared in Britain. What happened to most towns after the end of the Roman period? Well, most of them seem to have been abandoned. That economic market system seems to have been something that at that point didn't survive the end of Britain being part of the Roman Empire. What most of, when were most of today's towns and villages founded? So when were the places we're living in? When does their continuous occupation go back to? Well, the answer to that is the Anglo-Saxon period between sort of roughly the reign of King Alfred and the Norman Conquest. Most settlements today have some evidence for some sort of habitation somewhere underneath them from that period. Which historic pandemic had the worst impact on settlements in the British Isles? Well, it isn't the current coronavirus epidemic, not yet anyway. Um, the answer is in fact the oldest of those three, the Black Death, 1348 to 9 in Britain, uh, which wiped out almost half the population. And then which historic period saw the biggest growth in the size of Britain's cities and towns, the biggest settlements? And the answer to that is it's the post-World War II period, um, when huge amounts of construction was carried out to replace war-damaged housing and also housing that had existed previously that was no more no longer fit for habitation. Now all of the events that are featured in those questions are events that will have affected the place you live in one way or another whether there's any evidence for it known or not yet. So how did you get on? Did you do well? And do you think you know a little bit more now? There is generally very little written down that can tell us the answer to these questions. And that's mainly because written sources are written by one person over one lifetime. And they tend not to span long periods of time. So it can be quite difficult to trace change um, when you're reliant on documentary records. So how do we find out? Well, let's have a look and see what the archaeology can do. 
Anywhere you dig, you're likely to find stuff. Um, and it doesn't have to be somewhere that looks an impressive place. Uh, you can see here, this is a, a shovel full of finds that have come from the pit that those two boys in the background are digging there. Um, and that pit is in this village. It's a nice village, but it has no particularly remarkable history to it that we know of. It's not a massive tourist attraction. Um, it's a place typical of where millions of us live today. And then this collection of finds came from somewhere very different. It came from one of those post-World War II housing estates that we were looking at in the quiz, um, with pottery going back 800 years, just from somewhere that you wouldn't think had got very much history to it at all. So what I'm going to do now is ask you to have a little look at how an ordinary place like your school, for example, what sort of archaeological evidence might come from that? Here's a picture of a test pit um, that was dug, just a one metre square excavation. You can see the size of it there. Um, in this school playing field in Cambridgeshire, it looks like it's completely empty. Um, but let's have a look and see what turned out from it. So as I talk through, write a sentence for each of the different layers to say what you think the finds from that layer have revealed about what was happening in the past. When we dug it, it was a school playground, not a school playing field. So the finds from the first layer, that's context one, uh, the top layer, um, that you can see here, well, they were all very modern, as you might expect. Um, there was a lot of modern drainage pipe, um, so that us that had obviously got damaged and then kind of reburied there. Um, there were also some finds that seemed to relate to the school. Quite a lot of glass milk bottle milk bottles there from a time when children used to be given milk at school. And then there's a bit of plastic here as well. Absolute classic find of the uh, 20th century. It's plastic. It's, it turns up everywhere, and it's a uh, diagnostic find really for the later 20th century, a small sort of lid from a little sweet container there. So we can see the, the school activity um, and also a certain amount of sort of, uh, well, obviously damage to some drain pipe, probably when the school buildings were being made and uh, something got damaged and it was uh, the, the broken pipe was just uh, put back away. So the next layer down is very different. It's only 20 centimetres below the surface. It's only about sort of that much below the surface. Um, and it's only 10 centimetres below the layer we've just looked at. The finds are very different. Um, for a start, there's interestingly um, some hint of continuity there because that object that's circled in red there is a glass marble. Now, it's not a marble that's deliberately made for children to play with. It's actually the, um, it was used to seal glass bottles of fizzy drink. But they were very popular with children who would break the necks of the bottles to get the marbles out so that they could then play marbles with them. Now, we quite often find marbles uh, when we're digging in school grounds or in uh, village gardens or even on the uh, post-war housing estate. We find a lot of marbles. But they look quite different. They're clear glass ones with a sort of band of colour in the middle. This one you can see here is opaque and green, um, absolute classic, but probably relates to the Victorian period when this site was still a school. But then what we've also got is a lot of blue and white Victorian pottery. Blue and white is very popular in the Victorian period. It's absolutely classic. Um, and that suggests that we're going back perhaps just a little bit before the time that this playing field became part of the school. So we wouldn't really expect children to be bringing a lot of uh, their best china into school with them. So that's just taking us back before the school, only 20 centimetres below the surface. Now we're at uh, 40 centimetres below the surface and the finds are completely different. Again, 
So we've got um, some shiny black pottery there, uh, pottery with shiny black glaze on it. This dates to the sort of 16th century, the Tudor period, period of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Um, it's absolutely classic of that period. But what you can also see is how different the other finds are. So there's a little bit of animal bone, including that sheep's tooth. Now, tooth comes from the skull. That's not a meat-bearing bit of the animal, so it's just might have been a farm or something like that there where they're actually rearing the sheep. And then there's a nail, a handmade nail. This isn't a modern nail. Again, it suggests that there's um, people living there at a much earlier period um, with some sort of um, building, perhaps, um, that the nail was helping secure. And then down at 50 centimetres below the surface, half a metre below the surface, finds are very different again. We've got some rough earthenware pottery with no shiny black glaze on it. It's got no glaze on either side. It it's, uh, looks like biscuit, really. Um, that's dating to the sort of 12, 1300s, so we're talking 800 years ago. Um, and then the other finds are, there's a... Uh, Another nail here, but this is a slightly longer nail, and it's a horseshoe nail. And in fact, we've also got a couple of bits of horseshoe there as well. Now, that nail hasn't been used because when uh, used to nail a shoe onto a horse's hoof, they bang them in and they usually get bent over. This one, that hasn't happened to. So that suggests the nails are waiting to be used at this place. And those two bits of horseshoe there, suggests perhaps there's something like a, a blacksmith's perhaps on that site. So I think perhaps you can see from that how much the archaeology does show how the use of this place changed over time. If you want to have a more extended talk about that, then pause the video now and discuss and think about maybe why it changed or whether there's any gaps in the middle that we haven't looked at and perhaps what would have been found if the people digging that test had gone even further down. Now, these small one meter square test bits are quite easy to dig if you've been taught and if you follow the instructions. Um, and usually, like in the test bit we've just looked at, if you go deeper, you find older stuff. And the older stuff is, in many ways, the more valuable it is because there's less and less written evidence as we go further back in time. So we're more and more reliant on the archaeology, on the physical evidence to give us that long term history of any place like the place that you live in. We'll break briefly now if you want a quick break and we'll carry on for part two. So picking up again with part two of tracing places, what I want to help you discover now is the way that while we've looked at one of these one meter squares and how just digging a small test pit anywhere may discover finds from decades, centuries, thousands of years ago, even if it's just fragments of brick from a building or slate from a roof or a nail, It'll tell you something about the past. But what I'm going to show you now is how combining lots of these one metre squares together can start to reconstruct the whole history of whole settlements. So not just one garden or one school playing field, but actually a whole place. Um, a place I'm going to uh, look at with you is a place called Purton in Hertfordshire. You can see some pictures of it here. Just like the village we looked at earlier, it's a very nice village, but it's nowhere with any particular claim to historical fame. It's the sort of village that anybody could be living in. So this is the essential landscape, the basic physical landscape into which this village came to be and now exists. Um, as you can see there, there's a couple of streams, one leading off uh, up to the top of the page, one leading off uh, to the right. There's a spring where the water is first sort of coming out of the ground and feeding that stream. 
and generally the lower ground is at the top of the page and the higher ground is at the bottom of the page. So the land is sloping gently up a hill um, and where the, you can see the brown lines that are uh, running across the map are showing uh, where the height changes. Um, so you've got an idea of the topography, the natural landscape, and the essential basic features, the water that's there. So what I'd like you to do, in your booklet, um, you've got maps for um, each of the main historic periods here, the Roman, the early Anglo-Saxon, the late Anglo-Saxon, the high medieval, the late medieval, the sort of Tudor Stuart Georgian period that archaeologists tend to refer to as post-medieval, uh, and the Victorian modern period, the 19th and 20th century, and of course, including the 21st century now. Um, have a think um, about where you think people would have been living at those different times. And for each of your maps, just colour in the squares where you think people were living. So the first one's Roman. So I'll give you a few minutes to colour in where you think um, Roman people in the Roman period, who were probably the descendants of people who've been living there before. They're not going to be people who've come from Italy. Uh, they're just under new uh, administration. They've got new, new bosses, as it were. Have a think about where people might have been living then. Remember, this was the period when the first towns were introduced to Britain. case you've had a minute to think about where um, people might have, uh, which places people might have dug in. So each of those squares that you've now coloured in some of, each of those is one of these one metre square test pits. So for that particular spot, we do actually know something about whether people were living there at different times, because we've been able to look at the pottery that came from it and date that. So from that, we can see which test pits produced Roman pottery, and that tells us where people chose to live at that time. The next slide I'm going to show you is the one where all of the test pits that produced Roman pottery turn into circles, black or grey circles. So if you coloured in a square that turns into a black and grey circle, then well done, you got the right place. The bigger the circle, the more pottery. So the more likely it is there were people living there. So this is a result for the Roman period. OK, there it is. So it looks like um, people in the Roman period were attracted to the location beside the stream. That provides uh, water for washing and drinking and cooking and perhaps um, brewing um, for all sorts of other purposes, uh, feeding their animals. Um, it seems they were also attracted to live around the spring. Again, good source of fresh water that hasn't had a chance for anyone's animals upstream to uh, be uh, dropping their dung in it or people to be churning it up with their washing. And they also seem to be living down on the um, bottom side of the map as well, as you can see down uh, near the other stream. So we've got a kind of long linear settlement, perhaps a quite regularly laid out village perhaps uh, at the top of the page, and then another smaller settlement down at the other side. Nothing really much in the middle. It's a little cluster of pits um, on the top of the page in the red circle at the top of the page that have produced tiny amounts of pottery, just one tiny shirt. That might well be where the fields were, where the pottery had been taken out with the rubbish, ploughed onto the fields and got broken up into very small pieces. So the next period then is the early Anglo-Saxon. Have a think about what might have happened to these settlements up to the end of the Roman period, and where people might have been choosing to live in the early Anglo-Saxon period. So now you've had a chance to think about where people were living in the Anglo-Saxon period, and you've coloured in the squares on your second map. Let's see where people were actually living. So, a big change 
all of that settlement at the top of the page has disappeared. We've had no early Anglo-Saxon pottery from any of those test pits. And of course, having got down to the Roman material, we'd expect the Anglo-Saxon material, which is, uh, happens after the Roman period, to be sitting on top of that. In fact, there's only one test pit in the whole of more than 100 that have been dug in Purton that's produced even a single shard of pottery of early Anglo-Saxon date. It's quite close to where that earlier, smaller Roman settlement was, uh, on the edge of the hillside, going towards the higher ground, not far from that stream. But that streamside settlement that was clearly very attractive to Roman in the Roman period clearly hasn't survived. So now go on to the late Anglo-Saxon period. So this is the period from about 850, uh, Red King Alfred, to uh, 1066, the Norman Conquest. Um, it's a period, if you remember, when many of today's villages and towns were founded, where we find the earliest evidence. So again, colour in the squares on your map um, to uh, indicate where you think people would have were living in the late Anglo-Saxon period. Okay, you've had a chance to uh, colour in the squares where you think people might have been living in the late Anglo-Saxon period. Now here's the result. Now, even though the population is growing again, and this is when most settlements are founded, it's interesting to see that people are not on the whole moving back to where that Roman settlement was at the top of the page. The main area of settlement is in the centre, where there was no settlement in the Roman period really at all. And down in this area, right in the south of the settlement. It's interesting that people seem to keep coming back to that. It's the area with the greatest sort of continuity of settlement. It's also interesting to note that we know there was a late Anglo-Saxon cemetery in the middle of the settlement. You can see it indicated on the screen there. So now have a think about where people might have been living in the high medieval period. It's a period of um, considerable population growth. So most settlements are growing at this time. So have a think about where you think uh, this settlement might have grown to in the high medieval period. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Okay, so you've now had a few minutes to think about where people were living in the high medieval period between the sort of Norman conquest and the Black Death, about 1066 to about 1300, 1350. Um, I wonder how many squares you coloured in for that. Because you could have got away with colouring in pretty much all of them. As you can see here, nearly every single of those white squares have turned into a black or grey circle. Um, there's just a few in the middle of the village that haven't produced pottery. But apart from that, pretty much every pit is producing pottery and every pit is producing a lot of it as well. There's um, very few pits with just small circles. Um, you can see there's a major new extension to the settlement on the southwest side here. It's interesting to note there's a 12th century church is built there and a 12th century Morton Bailey Castle. It looks like this is a planned 12th century extension to the settlement that's probably been laid out um, uh, just to be close to the castle, perhaps so that the people who worked in the castle were well under the Lord's eye. Um, we can also see there's um, a considerable growth of settlement around the area where the springs are. But this is also somewhere where there's a 13th century moat. And that's a kind of high status site as well. Um, uh, there's another extension to settlement in the area there, just on the north of the settlement, up a little lane. Uh, another one where there's another moat um, right up in the north. So we can see that that Anglo-Saxon settlement that was founded in the sort of the centre and the southeast of the map has grown hugely in this period. So now have a look at the next map and think about where you think people might have been living in the late medieval period. Um, so this is the period after the Black Death, which you remember was that pandemic which wiped out half the population of England, probably. Have a think about 
where people might have been living in Perton after that. So you've now had the chance to think about where people were living, where the pottery is coming from, uh, by colouring in these squares uh, on the maps, on your maps now. And those are the ones that have produced any pottery. There's a massive decrease. Um, I said that nearly half of the population of England perhaps was wiped out by the Black Death. Perton seems to be much worse affected than that. When we compare it to what went before, we can see the massive degree of change. There are whole areas of the village are producing absolutely no pottery at all. Um, you can see that centre area, that Anglo-Saxon founded settlement that was so densely uh, populated in the high medieval period. It's just a scatter of pits producing a bit of pottery. Most of them are not producing very much. Um, and we can see other areas where, including that area that really, since the Roman period, has been such a focus, is also very badly affected. So now have a look at the Tudor Stuart Georgian period, the post-medieval period, the period between the 16th century and the 18th century. It's a period when the population starts to grow again. It's the period of the Industrial Revolution when pottery is more widely produced. Again, colour in the squares that you think um, show where people were living in Perton at that time. Okay, you've had a chance to think about that. So that is the pattern there. And you can see that actually the settlement is growing again. The area um, around the, uh, the, the very south of the map is coming back into habitation. But mostly the areas that are growing are the areas outlined in red there that are running up the road that runs through the village. So the area near the higher ground hasn't suffered as badly, that's still very intensely inhabited, still seems to be the main bit of the settlement, um, but that area along that road where those red circles are starting to become more into use. Those streamside settlement that was so favoured in the Roman period and also in high medieval, but then everywhere, uh, people were pretty much having to live everywhere in the village then, those streamside areas seem to be less in favour. They're very much on the edge of the village in the Tudor Stuart Georgian period. So now think about where you think people uh, would have been living in the Victorian period, period of population growth, um, for sure, um, and a period when, because of mass production, we find a lot more stuff anyway, because people were using a lot more stuff, because it was cheaper and easier to get hold of. So you've had a few minutes to colour in um, the squares that you think were inhabited on the Victorian, in the Victorian period. And here are the answers to that. And as you can see, pretty much every test pit, again, is producing pottery. Um, just a few on the very edge of the village are producing just a tiny amount. And one or two, again, on the very edge of the village aren't producing any. Um, but what this is showing us really is the form that the village had taken by the time we get the first maps. And in fact, this very strongly maps to the settlement today. So there you can, you can see the modern map um, and you can see that the test pits are producing pottery really very strongly uh, reflect that distribution. And you can see as they just fade away here, you can see how much the pottery reflects that current settlement. But it's interesting to see the impact of the Black Death on that settlement and how long it took the village to recover. Even up to the end of the 18th century, the village hadn't recovered to its pre-Black Death levels. And this is a story we wouldn't have known apart from, from the archeology. span And for the Roman period, we had no idea and again, for the Anglo-Saxon period, absolutely no idea at all. We now have quite a rich history of this village, all from just a few one metre square holes in the ground and a load of broken bits of pottery.
So finally, we could just think about how typical Purton is, because if you scale up again, and you do lots of these one metre squares in lots of villages, and that's exactly what uh, I have done, um, you can start to see how different places compare. So in this map, Purton is circled in red. It's on the sort of bottom left-hand side of the page there. So you've got copies of this map um, in your booklet. Um, and these show all of the settlements where we've done some test bit excavation, where we know something about some of those stories of how places changed over time. And the grey lines on the map are the rivers. And the orange shaded area is the area of the best agricultural land. So what I'd like to do, just to have a bit of a think about if you were living in the high medieval period, when, you, as you remember, Purton was so densely settled, so densely inhabited, virtually every test pit producing large amounts of pottery, which settlements do you think you would have, which settlements do you think were the ones that would have done really well? If you were wanting to live in a thriving, tightly packed, densely inhabited settlement where there was lots going on, which ones would you have gone for? A look at them and have a think about which ones are situated where in relation to the to the coast to the rivers which of course provided opportunities for trade which was a uh, important way that medieval communities could make a living but also the ones that are on the good arable land which in the period between the Norman conquest and the black death was absolutely vital to the economy of england so choose 10 settlements uh, that you think you'd place a bet on for doing well, for being the biggest settlements in the high medieval period, in the run up to the Black Death. Of course, they wouldn't have known that then. So choose 10 settlements. And when you've done that, we'll see how your settlements got on. So I hope you've chosen your 10 settlements. Shall we see how they did? So, this is showing you here. So on this map, the uh, settlements where the largest percentage of test pits have produced pottery are shown as the biggest circle. So the bigger the settlement, uh, the, uh, the bigger the circle, the bigger the settlement is. And you can see uh, Purton is a large circle. That's one of the largest, in fact. More than 60% of the test pits produce pottery. In fact, uh, you know, much more than that did so. If we made the circles any bigger, they'd all run into each other. Um, so how did your settlements get on? Which ones did you choose? Did you go for ones that were on the sort of major river system of the Ouse, which is where all those settlements in the sort of uh, center left hand side of the map sort of from Purton uh, and upwards from there um, and on that orange arable land that's where they're all sited on the rivers that serve the ooze which is a major river draining into the wash up here to the north um, and also on the good arable land also a cluster of settlements are doing very well down in the center of the map slightly more to the right you can see them clustered there they're doing well out of sort of cloth trade and the wool trade. Um, they haven't got the good arable land, but they've got sort of another strategy for earning a living. And then there's a ring of settlements around the coast that are doing quite well, uh, particularly if they're on good arable land and they've got access to the coast. But elsewhere on the non-arable land um, and on the areas that are kind of inland and furthest away, uh, from the uh, navigable rivers that you can get a decent sized boat up to use um, for trade, the settlements are much, much smaller. So now have a think about which settlements were worst affected by the Black Death. We've seen the impact it had on Purton. So now have a think, bearing in mind that the Black Death reduced the number of people available to work on the land. And if you're going to um, have an economy that relies on people farming the land, you need a lot of people to do that because it's hard work. Um, but there were fewer people available, it made the arable settlements more difficult uh, to sustain and a lot tougher to live in. So have a think about which settlements might have done worst at that time? Which ones would you have been tempted to move away from 
um, given that things could be getting very tough there. And in many cases, the Lords simply gave up trying to cultivate the land altogether, turned it over to sheep, and then there was no work for anybody living in the village. So again, choose 10 settlements you think might have been the worst affected. And if you fancy, have a think about which ones you think might have been a good bet, which would have been the good places to go to. So you've had a chance to think about which would have been the worst affected settlements for the Black Death and which would have been the good places to move to. So again, the archaeology can tell us because we can give us that comparison. So when we look at the evidence, you can see what happens there. Those settlements on that orange agricultural land have nearly all massively shrunk. When we compare that to the previous picture, if I just go back, you can see that's before and that's after. You can see the impact that that drop in population, and the population didn't bounce back for hundreds of years. You can see the impact it's had on the settlement. Those scores of settlements where we've done the test bit excavations across this part of eastern England, um, you can see that impact. Did you choose the right ones? Did you spot which ones were going to be really severely affected? Did you manage to pick any that were actually were doing well? Because it's interesting to see there's a cluster that are. So there's ones down in the sort of centre of the map um, are doing well. They're, again, they're very reliant on the cloth trade and on market economy as well. So they're where there was an opportunity to make a living, perhaps a freer living, not living in a village where a lord was looking over you, but in a town where you could be in charge of your own destiny, but also where there was money to be made from producing cloth or, if you were a merchant, from trading it. Uh, it's also interesting to see those settlements on the east coast there, Warberswick and Blythe, were also doing well, benefiting from uh, the, the important ports nearby. Southwold and Walgerswick. And also, actually, up at Thorny on the Fenland. Uh, it's just a bit of a puzzle, really. Um, we're not quite sure why Thorny has been so different. But again, that's a story we wouldn't have known without the archaeology. So, finally, just to tie all of this together, one of the things that is very interesting about having done these test pit digging, to look at the way the settlements changed over time, is that now, we've done so many now, um, more than 2,000, that actually we know precisely how often we'd expect to find pottery of different dates. And that means even if you dig just a single test pit, you can compare the pottery you're finding and you can work out how common it is or how unusual it is. So you can see Purton on this map in the red line. And you can see how this is showing you the percentage of pits that are producing pottery in different periods. So in Purton, you can see nearly 20% of pits are producing Roman pottery. And you can compare that to the averages for the whole of all of those 2,000 pits in eastern England. That line showed in blue. So you can see Perton's doing considerably better than average. It's a bigger Roman settlement than average, because on average, only about 10% of pits produce Roman pottery. And that tells you if you dug a test pit and found Roman pottery, it's only, you'd, you'd be one of only 10%. Only one in 10 test pits will produce Roman pottery. So that shows you how unusual it is. You can see Purton, like the average, just drops to virtually zero for the early Anglo-Saxon and the middle Anglo-Saxon period. And then you can see Purton picking up. By the time you go to the late Anglo-Saxon period, it's got around 30% of the pits are producing pottery of that date. That's considerably higher than the regional average, which is only 10%. But again, if you have pottery of late Anglo-Saxon date, You'll know that on average, only 10% of pits produce that, only one in 10. Looking at Perton again, we can see how it soars in the high medieval period, 80% of pits producing pottery of that date, considerably more than the 40% which on average produce that. So if you have high medieval pottery, 
still fewer than half test pits produce that. But you can see also how sharply Perton drops. It's, it's become a bigger settlement, a more tightly packed settlement, but actually after that, the fall is steeper um, as it drops down to much closer to the national average, which is around about 20%. It's about 30% in Perton, but um, it's much closer to that 20% average. But we see how widespread that drop is caused by the Black Death. And then we can see how Perton is picking up and very much tracking the regional average, the national pattern. Um, so by the time we get to the post-medieval period, around 60% of test pits are producing pottery, that sort of Tudor Stuart Georgian period. And by the time we get into the modern period, around 90% and in some places 100% of test pits are producing material of that modern date. So the takeaway from that really is that if you dug was one test pit and found one shirt of medieval pottery, of high medieval pottery, you'd still, you'd be able to know that only 40% of pits, only four in 10 pits actually produce any of that. So you'd know how unusual that is. So in this session of Dig School, we've asked how we can reconstruct how a place developed when there's no written evidence and we've seen how archaeology can help us do that by enabling us to date finds and see where they've come from and you can do that for one individual spot or you can do it for a whole village or even a whole region and that answers the next question where can we do that well you could do it anywhere within reason as long as you find somewhere safe with someone's permission to dig you can do this anywhere in the UK. Um, and thinking about why does this matter? This is amazingly important because it gives us a way of reconstructing histories of long-term development of the ordinary places that we all live in that we don't have from any other source. So I hope you've enjoyed that episode of Dig School and that next time you walk anywhere you'll have a little bit of a think about what might be lying underneath your feet that remains from the past. So thank you for watching this episode of Dig School. I hope to see you at another Dig School sometime soon.